We want to thank God uh, for the uh, audio and visual team and uh, for those who serve, uh, for uh, the, the Thorntons and uh, for uh, the, the Greens as well, and as well as our uh, newest members for uh, Chris and Becky Enlow serving us as well uh, today, and we're grateful uh, for that. Uh, for those of you who've been uh, with the church for longer than the last three months, uh, you'll also remember that uh, before the coronavirus pandemic uh, began, uh, that we were studying through the Gospel of Matthew uh, together as a church. And uh, we haven't forgotten about Matthew, uh, our friend Matthew, we haven't forgotten about him. And it's our plan to return to the study of, of Matthew since we've been able to start meeting as a, as a church again. And the, the last time that we were in Matthew, uh, we stopped just before what's known as the Great Commission in uh, Matthew chapter 28, uh, verses 16 down to 20. And I want to confess to you up front that there's so much more to this text than we'll have a chance to cover in a day. And uh, the more I studied this passage is really the deeper that it got. Uh, so what we're going to do this morning is just give you an extended introduction to the passage and uh, begin to dive into the passage of, of Matthew uh, next week. So uh, today we'll serve as a lengthy introduction with some application along the way. So just by way of background, the theme of Matthew, the book of Matthew, the gospel of Matthew, is Jesus Christ as king. Jesus Christ is king. And in this gospel, Jesus Christ is presented as the long-anticipated Jewish Messiah who offers the kingdom of God to men. And the evidence for this claim is, is really borne out throughout the entire book. The opening of the gospel of Matthew starts off with a genealogy. And uh, as we even uh, looked at the, the back end of uh, the book of Ruth and how genealogies are important. And uh, Matthew gives us evidence right up front in the Gospel of Matthew, that Jesus Christ is the king that's been anticipated. Even in the genealogy, that Jesus Christ is the son of David, the son of Abraham. The fulfillment of the biblical prophecies regarding the Messiah give evidence of Jesus as the Messiah, his right to rule. His impeccable character gives evidence of his right to rule. The, the miracles that Jesus performs give evidence of his right to rule. He is the king. And the teaching that he utters gives evidence of his right to rule. And by the, the end of the, the book of, of Matthew, I mean every possible way to prove that Jesus is Messiah has been exhausted. I mean, what else could you ask for? What other test could you possibly use to recognize that Jesus Christ is the true king? All the cumulative evidence points to only one unique person in all of human history who could qualify to be the Messiah. And Jesus is that Messiah. He's the anticipated king, and Matthew writes to defend that claim, to declare and to defend the claim that Jesus is the king, the Messiah. And if we were to read through the book of Matthew, uh, we would have seen the reception of the king by a few in chapters 1 through 10, the rejection of the king by many in chapters 11 through 27, and all of that is followed by the resurrection of the king by God in chapter 28. So even death could not stop this king. And in chapter 28, as we, we cross the threshold of chapter 28 in Matthew, we really arrive at the center point of all of human history. This is, this is the pivotal point at where history turns. Because if there is no resurrected Christ, there is no Christian faith to proclaim. If Jesus did not rise from the dead, we do not have a Christ who has followers, who makes disciples. It would be like having a building with no foundation, a body with no head. What is Christianity without a resurrected Christ? As 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and verse 19 says, if we have hoped in Christ in this life only, we are of all men the most to be pitied. The entire system of Christianity falls apart if Jesus Christ did not rise from the dead. If the resurrection is false, all hope is lost, changes absolutely everything. And that's why from the beginning, it's always been Satan's plan, his plot, to, to cover up the news of the resurrection. And just briefly, I want to show you the context of Matthew chapter 28 before we get to the text, because right alongside of this great commission that's given by the Lord, there's a contrasting commission from the world. It's, it's, it's to supplant the truth with a lie. Look at the verses uh, 62 to 66 in uh, chapter 27. It says, now on the next day, the day after the preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered together with Pilate and said, sir, we remember that when he was still alive, that deceiver said, after three days, I am to rise again. 
Therefore, give orders for the grave to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples may come and steal him away and say to the people, he has risen from the dead and the last deception will be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, you have the guard, go make it as secure as you know how. And they went and made the grave secure and along with the guard, they set a seal on the stone. And it's fascinating to note that the enemies of Christ seem to be the only ones anticipating the third day. They were more interested in the third day than the disciples were. It seems like they were quicker to catch on to what Jesus predicted about himself than the disciples were. While the disciples are, are tucked away in hiding, the Pharisees are making all of the necessary preparations for the third day to make sure that Jesus stays in the grave. They took it seriously. Back in Matthew chapter 12 and verse 40, uh, Jesus says, For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the sea, monster, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. In John chapter 2 and verse 19, Jesus said, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. And the, 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 the Pharisees and the chief priests and the religious rulers, they got the idea that what he's talking about is his body. And we find this as a developing story in chapter 28. And we have these, these opposing stories that, that the, the Pharisees want to get out their story. We want to make sure that Jesus stays dead. And that if Jesus does rise again from the dead, that we can cover it up. We don't want this news to get out. And in a sense, like I said, there's really these two contrasting commissions that are happening at the same time. You have two groups of witnesses for the resurrection. You have the humble ladies, and you also have the hardened soldiers. You have two experiences with angels. You have the, the ladies who are told by the angels not to fear, and the soldiers who are overtaken by fear and become like dead men. You have two trips to Jerusalem. You have the ladies who go in joy to tell them that the Messiah has risen. They actually saw the risen Christ. They went back to tell the disciples that he's alive from the dead. And the soldiers also go in fear to the chief priest to say that the body's missing. You have these two reports that are given as well. The ladies report what they hear and the soldiers report what they hear. And after they give this report, you have two great commissions. There's the commission that was given to the disciples. The disciples are to go out and to proclaim that Jesus Christ is indeed risen from the dead. But alongside of that, you have the soldiers who are given their commission. Chapter 28 and verse 13, you are to say, his disciples came by night and stole him away while we were asleep. And like I said, how ridiculous is it to be a, a, a witness of what happens while you're dead asleep? But this is the kind of fabrication that the, the enemies of Christ have to come up with in order to contain the truth of who Jesus Christ is really is. They have to cover it up. From the very beginning, Satan has attempted to keep this message from spreading because he understands the power of the Great Commission. But the, the question is, is do we understand the power of the Great Commission? Do we understand the importance of the Great Commission? And like I said, there's so much that's, that's packed in these few brief verses at the end of, of Matthew. We have the Lordship of Christ. We have the deity of Christ. We have the presence and the power of Christ. We have the mission of the church, the practice of the church, the consummation of all things is even spoken of in this text. And we could go on and on. And, and next week, Lord willing, we'll begin to, to kind of explore all of the, the facets of this passage. But for this morning, I just want to remind us all about the great priority of the Great Commission, the priority of the Great Commission. That's the heart of of this text, text, Matthew chapter 28. I'll go ahead and uh, read it for you. Matthew 28, I'll start at verse 16. It says, But the eleven disciples proceeded to Galilee, to the mountain which Jesus had designated. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some were doubtful. And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit teaching them to observe all that I commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Why don't you bow your heads with me for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we uh, come before you uh, this morning, and uh, Father, we're grateful for the opportunity that we have to look at your word. Uh, Father, we pray that your word would instruct us, uh, that your word would, would motivate us to obedience. 
My Father, that you convict us and challenge us where we need to be convicted and challenged. My Father, if there are ways that uh, we haven't sought to be obedient to the commission that's given to us here, that if, if we're not involved in making disciples, Father, I pray that we would be convicted of that, that we would understand that this is the command for all believers, for all Christians, even to the end of the age, this is your command. Now, so Father, I pray that you'd help us uh, even this morning, Lord, that we would look to your word. Father, that we would submit ourselves to our head, Jesus Christ. He is the Lord of all. And Father, I pray that you'd use me as a weak instrument to be a blessing to your people, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. In the book of uh, Revelations, in chapter 7, starting at verse 9, we read these words. It says, After these things, I looked, and behold, a great multitude, which no one could count, from every nation and all tribes and peoples and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes and palm branches were in their hands. And they cried out with a loud voice saying, Salvation to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever Amen. And that's, that's where history is heading. History is heading to the throne of God in this great multitude, so much that, that no man could count from every nation, every tribe, every people, every tongue, standing before the throne of God and before the Lamb, crying out salvation to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. That is where history is heading. That's been the goal of history from the very beginning of history. When man fell in the garden, it didn't send heaven into a panic. You know, God's not up there wringing his hands, you know, falling out of his chair saying, oh my goodness, what's going on down there? I thought, I thought that this was going to work out. Look at what Adam and Eve did. They took of the tree. Can you believe it? That is not what's going on in heaven. It did not frustrate the plan of God when man fell into sin. Before the foundation of the world, God chose that men would be brought to himself. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 4. Just as he, listen to this, chose us in him before the foundation of the world, before the fall, before Adam and Eve took a bite of the fruit, before all that happened, God chose us in him that we should be blameless, holy and blameless before him. Before the foundation of the world, God chose the means of salvation. It was determined that we would be saved by the lamb who was slain. Jesus Christ was already in the mind of God, in the plans of God, to be brought to earth, to be the substitute for us before the foundation of the world. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 20. For he was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but has appeared in these last times for the sake of you. So, so he appeared in these last times, but he was foreknown before the foundation of the world that he would come. And the Lord has also chosen the method of communicating salvation to us as well. And God's method is God's men. He's not chosen to communicate the gospel today through angels or direct words from heaven. He's chosen to use men, to use us as his mouthpiece to communicate the gospel of God to those that he has chosen to save. You understand that? To those that he has chosen to save, he's determined also and chosen to use us to bring that gospel to them. Under the old covenant, the nation of Israel was given the responsibility of pointing the, the nations to God. They were to call the nations to come. Exodus chapter 19 and verse 5 and 6, it lets us know that the nation of Israel was uh, to be a kingdom of priests. And as a priest, you're, you're a mediator. You stand in the place of somebody else to, to represent them before the Lord. And God tells Israel that although the whole earth is mine, you will be to me a kingdom of priests. And the priests are to intercede on the behalf of others. Isaiah 42 verse 6 says this of Israel, I am the Lord. I've called you in righteousness. I will also hold you by the hand and watch over you. And I will appoint you as a covenant to the people, as a light to the nations. So, so Israel, one of the, the purposes for the nation of Israel was to be a light for the Gentiles, to point the Gentiles to God, to bring the nations to God. That was Israel's role. 
They were to be a light to compel the nations to come and to worship this God. And that mission hasn't changed for the New Testament church. But instead of, the, of compelling the nations to come, you know, kind of like being established, set up in a particular land and telling the nations to come and worship this God, what are we told to do? We're told to go. We're commanded to go. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9 says, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So we are now the royal priesthood. We're the holy nation. And we're called to go out and to proclaim the excellencies of him. So we must be about what God is about, calling the nations to himself. We're not calling the nations to, to come to us. We're commanded to go out to them, and that's the priority for the church. And it was the Lord himself who emphasized the importance of evangelism, the importance of this Great Commission, by including some form of the Great Commission in all four of each of the Gospels. So the Lord's emphasis on the Great Commission argues for the priority of the Great Commission. The Lord's emphasis on the Great Commission argues for the priority of it. We find it in Matthew chapter 28, which we just read, to go, therefore, make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. We also find it in the book of, of Mark, Mark chapter 16, verse 15. It says, and he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. We find it again in Luke chapter 24, starting at verse 46. And he said to them, thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and rise again from the dead the third day and that repentance for forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all the nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. Here to go. Proclaim. And then we find it again in another form in John chapter 20 in verse 21 where Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. You're being sent the Great Commission is, is like the punctuation mark of all the Gospels. And in addition to this, we find the final words of, of Christ on this earth, which are centered again in the Great Commission. We often think of uh, Christ's parting words as those given on the cross, but his final words are actually given in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, his final words on the earth. Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. Listen to what it says here. It says, But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria, and even to the remotest part of the earth. And after he had said these things, he was lifted up while they were looking on, and a cloud received him out of their sight. What, what were the last words of Jesus Christ before he was lifted up off of the earth into the sky? You will be my witnesses. You're going to be my witnesses. This, this argues for the emphasis on the great commission, the priority of evangelism. And this is a command for us today. I remember uh, I had someone argue with me that the Great Commission was not for us. And uh, you better be glad that the Great Commission was for us. Some people would argue that the, you know, this is just a command given to the apostles. You know, you, you better be glad that it's not just for the apostles. If it was, the gospel would have died out in the first century. You know, I'll, I'll agree that there are some statements that are limited to the original audience. Like in Acts chapter 1 and verse 4, the disciples are commanded to, to wait in Jerusalem until the power uh, came down from on high. Uh, that's not a command for us. You know, we don't have to go to Jerusalem and, and wait to get the Holy Spirit. That's not a command for us. But what we find in the gospel, in the Great Commission, it's a self-perpetuating command. And what I mean by that is that in the command itself, it includes the reproduction of that command in others. For example, if you look at Matthew 28, in verses, uh, uh, verse 20, it says the disciples were to teach those that they made disciples, they were to teach them to obey all that I commanded you. And what had Jesus just commanded them to do? He had just commanded them to make disciples. So if I become a disciple, what am I supposed to do? I'm supposed to make a disciple. And if I'm making a disciple, what am I to tell them to do? To make disciples. So it's this self perpetuating command. Make disciples who make disciples who make disciples. And the chain goes on until it reaches us today. And what are we telling other people to do? If we're making disciples, what are we telling them to do? It's your job to make disciples until the whole world is reached. 
until every nation, until this, this extends to the furthest corners of the globe. In other words, nobody would argue with, with the, the gospel needing to be spread to the furthest corners of the globe. So why would you argue against the Great Commission? And not only that, if you look at the, the commission again, Jesus says this. He says, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you, and lo, I am with you always until when? Even to the end of the age. If you want to declare that promise that Christ is with us even to the end of the age, which hasn't come yet, you also have to agree that this command is with us until the end of the age. Teaching them to observe all that I commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Nobody wants to argue that Christ isn't here with us. So why would you want to eliminate the command that he gave us and said that he would be with us in order to fulfill it? It doesn't make sense. The priority of the Great Commission is found in the emphasis that Jesus gave to the Great Commission. But not only that, we also have the presence of the church that argues for the priority of the Great Commission, the, the, the presence of the church. You know, often we talk about the, uh, the purposes for the church being, you know, to exalt the Savior, uh, to edify the saints, and to evangelize the lost, you know, exaltation, edification, and evangelization. But do you realize that evangelism is the only purpose of the church that requires that we stay on the earth? Every other ministry can be accomplished much better in heaven. As, as powerful as you think your worship service might be, what's going to happen in heaven is going to be a whole lot better. It's going to blow whatever we have down here out. The, the worship in heaven is going to be perfect. As dynamic as, you know, we, we pray that, that you know, our study of the word is and teaching and preaching, as dynamic as that might be, our understanding when we finally reach heaven, you know, when we're, we're no longer uh, children, but we're made fully mature, uh, when we see him face to face and we become like him, that's going to blow away whatever understanding we have right now of who God is, of who Christ is. When we get to heaven, our understanding will be made mature. We'll have a, a, a much better and greater understanding in that time. So what's left? We've, we've got evangelism, which is the one thing that we can't do in heaven that we can do right now on the earth. In heaven, we won't have to tell anybody to know the Lord. Everybody will know the Lord. There, there will be no evangelism going on in heaven. That's what happens now. That is the mission of the church on earth. And this is seen in the example of the entire church as they're engaged in evangelism. And that's the, the third point here. The example of the entire church argues for the priority of the Great Commission. In Acts chapter 8 and verse 4, it says, Therefore those who had been scattered went about preaching the word. You know, not, not, the, not the disciples, not the, the apostles, you know, the original uh, uh, apostles here, but it's, but it's those who went out, those who were scattered abroad. The people were scattered because of, of persecution that, that broke out under the hands of, of Saul. And the early Christians understood their priority to be sharing the gospel as they were spread abroad. We find in Acts chapter 8 and uh, verses uh, 1 to 4, if you want to go ahead and, uh, and read this with me, Acts chapter 8, look at Acts chapter 8 starting at, uh, at verse 1. Uh, just to show you the context here, Acts chapter 8, starting at verse 1, it says, Saul was in hearty agreement with putting him to death, speaking about Stephen, and uh, Saul was kind of uh, spearheading a persecution against the church. It says, and on that day, a great persecution began against the church in Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. So listen to this. The apostles stayed in Jerusalem. Everybody else was scattered abroad. Then it goes on to say, some devout men buried Stephen, made loud lamentation over him. But Saul began ravaging the church, entering house after house, dragging off men and women who had put them in prison. Therefore, those who had been scattered, understand the context again, not the apostles, you know, because the apostles weren't scattered. Everybody else was scattered except the apostles. So those who had been scattered went about preaching the word. It wasn't just the job of the apostles to preach the word. This is the job of the entire church, the example of the entire church, that the church, as it was scattered, preached the word. They were engaged in evangelism. Same thing we find in Acts chapter 8, verses 25 to 40, Acts chapter 11, 19 to 22. The early church advanced by disciples making disciples, not by apostles making apostles. 
It was the disciples that spread abroad and made disciples. So we have the example of the church that argues for the priority of the Great Commission. We also have the expectation of the entire church that argues for the priority of the Great Commission. There's uh, many of the verses that, that deal with uh, evangelism. They don't command it as much as they just assume it. They just assume that the church is participating in this. Over in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, if you want to flip over there, 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 5, starting at uh, verse 17, speaks about this ministry that we have of reconciliation. Look at verse 17. It says, Therefore, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. You know, we'd all say that, you know, we're, we're new creatures in Christ. Now all these things are from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us who? Those who have been reconciled to him, the ministry of reconciliation. Namely, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. And he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. It's expected that we who have been reconciled would be busy reconciling others to Jesus Christ. You know, I've been brought into a right relationship with God, and now my, des my desire is to see you brought into a right relationship with God. Over in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, it says, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. We've been chosen by God. We've been declared to be a holy priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession. Why? So that we may proclaim the excellencies of him. That, that's why you've been chosen. It's not just for yourself. It's so that you could proclaim the excellencies of Christ. And it's assumed that if you've been chosen by God, that you would be busy proclaiming his excellencies. You've been given a ministry of reconciliation. And, and here it's not so much commanded as it's just expected that if you've been chosen, why wouldn't you be proclaiming the excellencies of him? I mean, that's the purpose for which you've been chosen. It's expected that we would fulfill the Great Commission. Also, we have the history of redemption that argues for the priority of the Great Commission. Ever since the, the fall of, of man in Eden, the focus has been on the promised seed who would come to crush the head of the serpent. Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, where we have the, the first proclamation of the, the gospel. The, the, the good news is being proclaimed here in Genesis 3. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He, her seed, shall bruise you on the head, speaking about the serpent, about Satan, and you shall bruise him on the heel. Who is that seed? Seed is spoken of again in Isaiah 53. Verse 3 speaks about the seed being despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows acquainted with grief. And like one from whom men hide their face, he was despised and we did not esteem him. And all of redemptive history is, is looking for that, that seed who is to come. It all looks forward to him. And then from our standpoint, we look back to him, the one who has come and upon him, the iniquity of us all fell upon him. And we find that the, the focus in heaven is that same seed. Revelation chapter 5, verse 11, it says, And I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, and the living creatures and the elders, and the number of them was myriads of myriads, and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. What's, what's the focus of, of heaven? What's, what's the center of heaven? Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. I mean, that is the focus of of eternity. Jesus Christ, the lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. The work of Christ on the cross as the sacrificial lamb, the one who would come and bear the iniquities of his people. That is going to be the focus of heaven. That's going to be the focus of, of all of eternity. Why wouldn't it be the focus of us now? Why wouldn't the cross be our focus even now? It only makes sense that if the Savior's work on the cross is the focus of redemptive history from Genesis 3.15 all the way clear to the book of Revelation, why wouldn't it be our focus now? It argues again for the priority of the Great Commission, the work of declaring the good news about Jesus Christ. 
Not only that, but the love of men also argues for the priority of the Great Commission. Matthew chapter 22, Jesus recounts the, the two greatest commandments in Matthew chapter 22 over in verse 37. Matthew 22 and verse 37. It says, and he said to them, said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. And remember, this is uh, Jesus uh, speaking to the, to the lawyer who came to him to ask him, you know, what's the greatest commandment of the law? He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And beloved, I, I just like to say that if, if we take hell seriously, which I'm assuming we all do, there can be little doubt that the most loving thing that you can do for your neighbor is to be an instrument to warn them about the destruction to come. If, if you have a real love for your neighbor, if you have a real love for your neighbor, it won't just be about their temporary kind of peace and tranquility here on earth. It will be about their eternal peace and tranquility and eternity. I mean, that's what you're going to be most concerned about if you have a love for your neighbor. There's many of us who've heard uh, different authors and pastors deny the reality of hell. And as, as Christians, as, as the Christian community, we rightly are offended by that. We're disturbed by that, that, that people would deny the reality of what Scripture talks about. But I wonder if we're, we're more disturbed that, that somebody would deny that hell exists than being disturbed that people are actually going to go there. There's this one author who said this. He says, it's, it's very easy to be up in arms, for example, about the current assaults on what can so commonly be described as the doctrine of hell. Of course there's a hell, we protest. Offended and disturbed that someone would deny what so plainly is written in the word of God. Is there a hell? Of course there is. But then the author goes on to say this, that if there is a hell, what difference has it made for you? What have we done differently because there is a hell? Is its reality driving our thoughts, words, and, and deeds? No, we, sh we should be troubled by the reality of hell. In fact, the Apostle Paul was, was so disturbed by the eternal fate of his fellow Israelites that he said this in, in Romans chapter 9, and this is one of those passages that always convicts me every time I read it. In Romans chapter 9, he says, I'm telling the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience bearing me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing grief in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed, separated from Christ for the sake of my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh. And I don't know if you truly understand what Paul is saying there. When he says that, that I could wish that I myself were accursed and separated from Christ, what is, he, what is he saying there? If you are accursed and separated from Christ, where do you spend eternity? You spend eternity in hell. And Paul is saying that I could wish that I myself were accursed and separated from Christ. If, if it took me going to hell so that my brethren could go to heaven, I'd make that exchange. That's what Paul is saying. It's the same kind of thing that that Moses said in Exodus chapter 32 when, when he asked God to blot his name out of his record so that the Israelites could be received into the promised land. Willing to make that exchange because he had that kind of heart for his brothers. Charles Spurgeon says, says this, Oh, my brothers and sisters in Christ, if sinners will be damned, at least let them leap to hell over our bodies. And if they will perish... Let them perish with our arms about their knees, imploring them to stay and not madly to destroy themselves. In another place, he speaks of some Orthodox ministers, and he says, These brethren spoke of sinners as of people whom God might possibly gather in if he thought it fit to do so, but they did not care much whether he did so or not. D do you care? Do you, do you have a love for people? If you have a love for people, wouldn't you warn them about the greatest destruction which is to come? You know, we can talk easier about the, the, the weather and, and other things with, with people than to talk to them about what's truly significant, what's truly eternally significant. And how different is the way that, 
that we respond and, and act around people and even our speech. How, how different is that from the way that the, the Lord responded over those that were dying without a savior? We have Jesus Christ himself who weeps over Jerusalem. Jesus wept over Jerusalem. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often would I have gathered your, you together as a hen gathers her chicks, but you would not. It, it broke the heart of Christ to know that people would not come to him. Does it, does it break your heart that people don't come to Christ? Do you, have, do you have a love for people? Does it break your heart? You have Jeremiah who, who weeps over, over Judah. It's called the, the weeping prophet. Wept over Judah, knowing that destruction was coming. He wasn't you know, rubbing his hands together and, and happy with, with joy to talk about their destruction. He wept over Judah. We have Paul weeping over his, his brothers according to the flesh in Romans 9. We have Moses asking for his own name to be blotted out. And today we should have that same kind of heart of compassion for those that are dying and on their way to hell. That, that it should break your heart. And that it should motivate you to open your mouth to share the good news of Jesus Christ. The love of men argues for the priority of the Great Commission. I also say that the glory of God argues for the priority of the Great Commission. Mankind was, was created for the glory of God. In Isaiah 43 and verse 7, talks about men whom I have created for my glory, whom I have formed, even whom I have made. Romans 11 verse 36 says, For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. And the spread of the, the, the gospel multiplies the glory that's given to God because every soul that's saved is another soul to glorify God. I like what uh, John Piper says. He says that uh, uh, missions exist because worship doesn't. You know, there are places where worship is not being given to God, and that's why missions should exist. That's why there needs to be people, there need to be people who are telling them about God so that we can increase the glory that's given to God. Like it, it broke Paul's heart when he uh, went into uh, um, to, to Athens and saw that there were people who were not worshiping God. Like it vexed his soul that there were so many that were, were serving and worshiping idols. 2 Corinthians 4, 15 says, For all things are for your sakes, that the grace which is spreading to more and more people may cause the giving of thanks to abound to the glory of God. That the, the more people who understand the grace of God, who receive the grace of God, is the more people who can give glory to God. The more grace, the more glory. The more grace that people have is the more glory that goes up to God. Every sinner who repents adds to the heavenly choir, glorifies God, brings more joy to heaven than over the, the 99 righteous that need no repentance, right? Heaven erupts over the salvation of one soul. I think John MacArthur had it right when he said, nothing glorifies God so much as his gracious redemption of damned hell-bound sinners. It glorifies God that people would come to God. Are you concerned about the, the glory of God? Does it, does it vex your soul that, that people give glory to idols? That there are people who do not give glory to God who deserves it? Like I said, in Acts chapter 17, while Paul was waiting in Athens, his, his spirit was being provoked within him as he beheld the city full of idols. I mean, that's, that's how it should trouble us. When we see people not giving glory to the, to the true and living God, it should trouble us, vex our souls. So what was Paul's response when he saw people serving idols? He began reasoning in the synagogue with the Jews and the God-fearing Gentiles in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be present. He got busy sharing the good news of the Great Commission. Like, like that should be the Christian response. You know, with all the trouble that we see in our world, what should the Christian response be? The response should be the gospel. That's the hope that we have to give men. It is the power of God unto salvation. Like that is the Christian response to the trouble that we see in our nation. It should be the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if you're concerned about the gospel, if you're concerned about the priority of, of Jesus Christ, what he gave emphasis to, if you're concerned about what the church is here for, if you're concerned about what the example of the church should be, if you're concerned about what the expectation of the church has been, 
If you're concerned about the history of redemption, the love for men, the glory of God, you'll be concerned about the Great Commission. You will be concerned about the Great Commission. This is the church's priority. And I just want to give you just, just briefly a couple of uh, practical applications. Uh, like I said, we'll, we'll jump into the uh, Great Commission proper uh, next week. Uh, and start to, to work our way through that. And like I said, there's, there's much more that's going to be found in this text than we'll have the, uh, the time to, to cover in a, in a message. So we're giving the extended introduction today, and then we'll, we'll dive in, like I said, uh, next week. But I just want to give you a couple of applications as we close. How do we, how do we respond to this? How do we respond to the priority of the Great Commission? Number one, we need to practice evangelism personally. We need to practice evangelism personally. What do you call a person who doesn't practice what they preach? A hypocrite, right? It's been said that one of the, the, the more common ways of avoiding evangelism is to escape to study and write about it. You know, we, we don't just want to study and write about the Great Commission. We want to be engaged in it. And preaching a sermon on evangelism, teaching a class on evangelism, reading a book on evangelism, writing an article on evangelism, listening to a sermon on evangelism, is no substitute for evangelism. You need to practice it. You need to practice what you preach. Uh, D. James Kennedy, who's well known for uh, the evangelism explosion program, he says, I've asked thousands of ministers how many of them have preached sermons on the need to witness and have taught classes on the subject. And most of them raised their hands. You know, yeah, I've, I've preached on evangelism. I've, I've taught on evangelism. But when I asked them how many of them make it a habit to take their people with them to go out to evangelize, only three or 4% usually respond. You know, so everybody says, oh, I wanna talk about it, wanna preach about it, write about it. But how many of you actually do it? He says, very, very few. It's a lot easier to, to talk about evangelism than it is to actually do it. And we can't wait for unbelievers to come to us. We're the ones who are commanded to go to them, right? It's one of the differences, like I said, between the Old Covenant and the, the New Covenant. Under the Old Covenant, you know, Israel was to stay put in Israel and to attract the nations to itself. Under the, the New Covenant, we're to go to the nations and proclaim the gospel to them. We're called to reach the nations. That's God's design for the church today. So we're to practice evangelism personally. We're also to prepare ourselves biblically. Prepare yourself biblically for evangelism. I remember a number of years ago, my daughters were getting their, their hair done, and um, there was a, a hairdresser that actually came to the house to, to do their hair, and we'll just, just call her Lisa for now. But she was the pastor's wife. You know, she was active in her church and, you know, married to this pastor for a number of years. And uh, she was also going to, uh, uh, to hospice to, to minister to people in, in hospice, uh, to the sick and to the dying. And I'm like, wow, that's, that's fantastic. That's great, Lisa. So I said, you know, well, what, what kind of things do you share with, with people who are, are sick and dying? And uh, she says, you know, I just, I just tell them to, to make the, the best of each day and, you know, just kind of live one day at a time. And, um, you know, I started thinking, it's like, is, like, Lisa, is that it? You know, she was telling me about this one guy, Richard, that she was talking to who the doctors had given only three weeks to live. So I said, I said okay, Lisa, just, just pretend that I'm Richard, okay? Like, pretend I'm, I'm Richard. I come to you and I say, you know, the doctor's only given me three weeks to live. You know, do, do you have anything to share with me? Any, any good news? You know, I heard you're a pastor's wife. Do you have any good news to share with me, Lisa? And she said the, the worst three words that a dying man would want to hear. She says, I don't know. I don't know. Three weeks to, to live. Pastor's wife says, I, I don't know what I share with them. I don't know. And I said, Lisa, it's because you don't understand the gospel. Because the gospel is the good news. I mean, that's the, the only news, the, the best news that you'd want to share with a dying man is the gospel of Jesus Christ. I said, you don't, you don't know the gospel. And then I spent the, the rest of our time together just explaining to her what the, the gospel was, the good news, that, that, that there is a God, right? That there's a God who's made you, who's made you for his own glory. But, but you've sinned against this God. You've decided to live your own way. You've, you've fallen short of his standards. And what God has done because he's merciful is he sent his son, Jesus Christ, the only one who could live perfectly in your place, the one that he could look upon and say, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. 
And because Jesus Christ lived perfectly, and because he was a substitute on the cross and he hung his head for all those who would believe, everyone who turns from their sins and trusts in Christ has the promise of eternal life. That is the good news. That's the gospel. That we can come to Jesus Christ, turn from your sins, trust in Christ, trust in the provision that's been made for you, and you can have eternal life. You need to make sure that you prepare yourself biblically to be able to share the good news of Jesus Christ. You need to practice evangelism personally, and you need to prepare yourself biblically for evangelism. Not only that, but you also need to participate by giving generously. Over in the, the book of Philippians in chapter one, Paul says this in uh, verse three, he says, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always offering prayer with joy in my every prayer for you all in view of your participation in the gospel from the first day until now. He says, you've participated in the gospel from, the, from day one. How, how did they participate? Philippians chapter four, starting at verse 15, it says, and you yourselves also know Philippians, that at the first preaching of the gospel, after I departed from Macedonia, no church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving, but you alone. For even in Thessalonica, you sent a gift more than once for my needs. Not that I seek the gift itself, but I seek for the profit, which increases to your account. But I've received everything in full and have an abundance. I'm amply supplied, having received from Epaphroditus what you have sent, a fragrant aroma and acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. The, the, the church in Philippi participated with the gospel. They participated with the gospel. How? By sharing of their resources with Paul. The church at Thessalonica, in part, was planted because the Philippian church was faithful to give. We actually find the same thing over in a, a book of Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, referring to the same church. It talked about this, uh, the, the churches of Macedonia begging us with much entreaty for the favor of participation in the support of the saints. And this not as we had expected, but they first gave themselves to the Lord and to us by the will of God. What does that mean? That, that means that in part, the, the, the churches at Jerusalem and also the, the church at, at Corinth and the church at Thessalonica was furthered in the gospel because of the participation of the church at Philippi. Financial support is another way to make sure that evangelism is a priority, participating and giving generously. Number four, we also need to be praying for souls passionately. Praying for souls passionately. To do the work of an evangelist, or to practice evangelism personally, prepare yourself biblically, participate by giving generously, and pray for souls passionately. If, if, if we're going to be successful in evangelism, we need to recognize that success doesn't come from us. It's not from us. We need to recognize that salvation belongs to the Lord, right? And all of these requests that we have in Scripture, there's so many requests that speak about how salvation and the, the work of evangelism actually comes from Him. If it's, if it's not for the Lord, this work doesn't get done, okay? We need to pray for more workers. Jesus talked about that in Matthew chapter 9, verse 38. We need to pray that, that God would keep the doors open for ministry. Colossians chapter 4, verse 3. We need to be praying for boldness to be engaged in evangelism. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 19. We need to pray that the gospel would spread and be glorified. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, and verse 1. And we need to pray for the salvation of souls. 1 Timothy 2, 1 through 4, Acts 16, and verse 14. We need to be praying. Pray that the Lord would open up hearts to believe. Acts 16 and verse 14 talks about how Lydia's heart was open to believe in the gospel. We need to be praying that the Lord would open hearts to believe. Do you pray for evangelism? Do you pray for it? Do you pray for the, the people that you have around you, your neighbors, your friends? Do you pray that the Lord would open up their hearts to believe? Because if it's not for the Lord, this work does not get accomplished. We need to be praying that the Lord would open hearts. And just briefly, I want to conclude by introducing you to a minister by the name of William Carey. William Carey was a, a missionary. He ministered in 18th century England long before any of the modern missionary agencies were conceived. During his time, there's a belief known as hyper-Calvinism, which still exists in some pockets today, but during this time it was more prevalent and actually held sway in a lot of Baptist churches that 
Kerry was a part of, and uh, hyper-Calvinism uh, taught that the call of the gospel should be restricted only to the elect. In other words, you're only supposed to preach the gospel to those who are elect. And how do you know who's elect? You know, beats me. <laughs> but, but, but they had this kind of belief that, you know, you're supposed to kind of discern whether or not somebody's elect, and, and then they only get the gospel. Only the people who God is electing get the gospel. Ian Murray says this of hyper-Calvinism, says they denied that there is a universal command to repent and believe and asserted that we only have warrant to invite to Christ those who are conscious of a sense of sin and their need. In other words, it is those who have been spiritually quickened to seek a savior and not those who are in the death of unbelief and indifference to whom the exhortations of the gospel must be addressed. So basically, you only find people that are interested and have a sense of their sin before you give them the gospel, but you don't give the gospel to anybody else. And they try to develop some scheme for trying to determine who they had reason to believe was elect, as if you could really determine that, as if you could really know. How can anybody determine the invisible moment that the Spirit is, is bringing life to a heart? How do you determine that? In John chapter 3, it says that the wind blows where it wishes. We can't determine where it comes from, where it's going. We, we have no idea. Like, like where the, the Spirit is regenerating a person? Nobody had any clue that, that the Apostle Paul would come to faith one moment before he believed. When, when he came to faith, he was on his way to, to bind people, to, to drag them back to Jerusalem, to bring judgment on Christians. Nobody would have had the foggiest idea that Paul was going to come to faith in that moment. Nobody would know that. We can't determine that. And William Carey saw this Understanding this doctrine that was prevalent during his time is just an excuse, a weak and poor, pathetic excuse for people not to share the gospel. And he said this, he says, it is thus that multitudes sit at ease and give themselves no concern about the far greater part of their fellow sinners who this day are lost in ignorance and idolatry. And Carrie couldn't think of the, the peoples or the lands of the heathen without having a deep interest in the salvation of their souls. And during the 18th century, it was during a time when new lands were still being uh, discovered and explored and Carey's read of these voyages, he read of these voyages and he said it became to, to him just a, a sorrow to his heart. He says a revelation of the sin and sorrow, the immorality, cruelty, misery of unevangelized peoples, a drama of the world's tragic ignorance of Christ and a door opening to hell. And he would collect the data about these nations, nightly add new locations on a leather map of places that he didn't even know existed. He was inspired by the biographies and diaries of other well-known missionaries, like uh, men like David Brainerd and John Elliott, who ministered to the American uh, Indians, and they, along with the Apostle Paul, became his heroes and his models. And although Carey experienced a, a measure of, of fruitfulness, in the congregation that he ministered to in England, his thoughts were driven to the lands that he had never seen, and he tried to convince an association of ministers to become a part of the work of bringing the gospel to these people, that they should consider whether the command given to the apostles to teach all nations was not also binding on them and on succeeding ministers to the end of the world, to the end of the age, seeing that the accompanying promise was of equal extent. If, if you take the promise, why not take the command? If you want to take the promise that Christ is with us to the end of the age, why not take the command that we're to go to all, to all the nations? Then it's reported that as he was trying to convince his association of ministers to be involved in the work of the Great Commission, that there was one older minister who stood up and replied, young man, sit down, sit down. You're an enthusiast. When God pleases to convert the heathen, he'll do it without consulting you or me. But Carey was undeterred by the opposition. He continued to think about evangelism, speak about evangelism, write about evangelism. The, the, the Great Commission going to every corner of the globe. Then he practiced evangelism personally. He was involved so much in local evangelism that a friend accused him of neglecting his practice, which was shoemaking. He was a cobbler by trade. And Carey replied, Neglecting my business? What are you talking about neglecting my business? My business, sir, is to extend the kingdom of Christ. 
I only make and mend shoes to help pay my expenses. He says, my, my, my real business is the gospel. You know, I'm, I'm just making shoes to, to pay for my expense to, to preach the gospel. That's my real business. The gospel is my business. He also prepared himself biblically. While engaged in his business of shoemaking, he also taught himself Greek with the help of a local villager who had a college education, and he later taught himself Hebrew, Italian, Dutch, and French while working on his shoes. I mean, talk about not having an excuse. You know, in the middle of working on shoes, he taught himself Greek, Hebrew, Italian, Dutch, and French. And he also participated by giving generously, and he encouraged others to do the same. He said giving should not be confined to the rich. If persons in more moderate circumstances were to devote a portion, suppose a tenth of their annual increase to the Lord, there would not only be enough to support the ministry of the gospel at home and encourage village preaching in our respective neighborhoods, but to defray the expenses of carrying the gospel into the uttermost parts of the world, into the heathen world. He participated in giving generously, and he also prayed for souls passionately. Three years after he made a suggestion that we should go into the, the heathen nations, the nations of those who do not know Jesus Christ, he published a, a groundbreaking missionary manifesto called An Inquiry into the Obligations of Christians to Use Means for the Conversion of the Heathens. And uh, that's a mouthful, but basically he's just saying that this, this is, this is to, to try to convince people to go out and do the Great Commission, start, start working in the Great Commission. It's the obligation of Christians to use means for the conversion of heathens. Like, like we're to be busy using what the Lord has given us to see other people come to Christ. That was his whole point. And Carey finally overcame the resistance to missionary efforts. And there was a, an association that was founded for missions work. And Carey himself became the first missionary sent by the society. Carey left for India June of 1793. He didn't see a convert for six years, labored for six years before seeing one person come to Christ. But God was pleased to use him to lay the foundation for many conversions to come. He was uh, responsible for the translation of the scriptures into the Bengali language, as well as several other Indian languages. He saw many missions built, untold numbers come to know the Savior. In the inquiry that he wrote when he was trying to motivate people, he said this, he says, what a heaven will it be to see the many myriads of poor heathens of Britons among the rest who by their labors have been brought to the knowledge of God. Surely a crown of rejoicing like this is worthy aspiring to. Surely it is worthwhile to lay ourselves out with all our might in promoting the cause and kingdom of Christ. Later on, he, he preached a, a missionary sermon called the, the Deathless Sermon using Isaiah 54, verses 2 to 3, as his text, in, in which he repeatedly said, expect great things from God and attempt great things for God. Expect great things from God. Attempt great things for God. And he was successful in seeing the gospel reach into India and actually motivating many others to do the same, to reach other lands for the sake of the gospel. And, and my question for, for us as a church is, is this the work that we're busy doing? You know, do, do you look at, at your job as just paying your expenses so that you can preach the gospel? Because your main business is to preach the gospel. You know, I'm just doing what I do so that I can pay my expense. My, my main business is to glorify God and to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. A while ago, I, I read this book titled The Brokenhearted Evangelist. Uh, and this is this is one of those books that needs like a warning label on it, you know. You know, read with caution. Now, I remember uh, just being convicted to tears as I read through this this book and got to the last chapter. And the book, uh, authored by a man named Jeremy Walker, he tells the story of a young man who was injured in an accident a month after being saved. So he's only saved for a month, and then he had this terrible accident, and it soon became clear that. It was a fatal injury and uh, that he was uh, about to die. And a Christian came to this young man who had just come to Christ for just a month, came to this young man and asked the young man if he was afraid to die. You know, he's only been saved for a month. And he asked this young man, are, are you afraid to die? 
And the young man replied, Friend, no, I am not afraid to die, for Jesus has saved me. But I have not been able to lead even one, such as I was, to Christ from the time I've known him. Only been saved for a month. And he's saying, I haven't been able to lead anybody to Christ yet. I'm not afraid to die, but oh, if I must go, must I go empty-handed? If I'm going to approach the Lord, must I go to the Lord empty-handed? And a New England minister who's moved by the account of this young man's words, he, he wrote this, he says, must I go empty-handed and thus my Redeemer meet? Not one day of service give to him, lay no trophy at his feet. Must I go empty-handed? Must I meet my Savior so? Not one soul with which to greet him, must I empty-handed go? Oh, the years of sinning wasted. Could I but recall them now? I would give them to my Savior. To his will I'd gladly bow. Oh, ye saints, arouse, be earnest. Up and work while yet it's day. Before the night of death overtake you, strive for souls while still you may. Strive for souls while still you may. There's a priority in the Great Commission, and it's a priority for all of us. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we uh, come before you, Lord, and uh, Father, we are grateful for the Great Commission. We're grateful because, uh, Father, we understand that it's through the preaching of the gospel that came to us that we came to know the Savior, that somebody shared the good news with us, whether it was directly by somebody's mouth whether it was picking up a track that somebody wrote, that somebody left, that somebody handed to us, whether it was by hearing a sermon, hearing a message of the truth of Jesus Christ, whether it was by picking up a Bible that, that people bled and died to have written in our own language, whether it was just by reading the text of Scripture we came to faith in Jesus Christ. Father, we are grateful and indebted to those who have come before us, those who have gotten the message to our ears, to our hearts. And Father, we know that that work, again, is credited to you, that you chose to use people to bring the good news of the gospel. And Father, I pray that you would be pleased to use us. And Father, the, the, the work of the gospel is not done. There, there's still more people to be reached. There are still more people to be reached through the power of the gospel, more people to be brought in and Father, I pray that, that we would have the joy, the personal joy of seeing people turn to Christ, that we would be able to, to, to lead somebody to the Savior, that as we enter into heaven and, and one day know that we'll breathe our last, Lord, that we'll know that there's others by our side who are also heading to the same destination, and some of them even because we've shared the good news of the gospel with them. And Father, I pray that you'd help us to be faithful as a church, Father, there's so much more work to be done, so much more work to be done in Baltimore, so much work to be done in Maryland, so much work to be done across our nation, across the world. Father, I pray that we would be invested in sharing the gospel personally, that we would be preparing ourselves biblically, that we would be giving generously to the work of the, the gospel of, of Jesus Christ, and that we would be praying passionately for souls to come to know you. My Father, help us to engage in this most important work, the work that you've left the church here to do. Help us to fulfill our mission, the mission that's been given to us by the Lord himself. And may you, Lord, be glorified and honored in your church for your glory, God, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.